Welcome back to another episode of the Vet Worthwhile Podcast. I am James Yost, Partner and Wealth Advisor at Signature FD, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Travis York, owner of 3-1 Advisors. Travis, how are you? I'm doing great today, James. How about yourself? I'm doing well. We are back with another episode of the Vet Worthwhile Podcast. Super excited about our guest today. Travis, who are we going to be talking to? We are uh, really lucky today. We have a good friend of mine, Rod Finnegan who is with Vet Insure, kind of the end-all, be-all when it uh, comes to veterinary insurance, probably knows a thing or two about beer. What else, Rod? I'm trying to think of other things that, that you know a little bit about. A little bit about bourbon and scotch. We could throw that in there, too. So oh, wow. We should wow. Have I don't even know why we're talking about uh, insurance and risk and protection and all that fun stuff. We should have just done <laughs> a scotch pod. We need to know about insurance before we get into scotch, though. Yeah, very true. So, Rod, like one of the things at our firm at Signature FD, we uh, we try to look at wealth in a couple different ways. Grow, protect, give, and live are the four pillars that we want to talk about with our clients that we want to help them with. Obviously, what you do fits in perfectly to that protect piece. So we were hoping to talk to you today about some of the things you see in the industry. I think we'll probably start with a little bit of the basics, and then I think we'll evolve into some of the things that are more modern, more cutting edge, more of a risk now than they were 15, 20 years ago. So with that in mind, you know, what are some of the key things that hospital owners should be prioritizing with respect to insurance? Like, What are the routine things you see a lot? I think for the most part, hospitals do fairly well with some of the basics. I mean, when they own real estate, you know, having the building insured, it's pretty routine. But a lot of the times that where we find mistakes, problems, or coverage gaps, and a coverage gap is just an area where a hospital should be insured and they're not either knowingly or unknowingly. And so we'll find problems with the building not being insured correctly. And since this post-COVID environment where we've seen a ton of inflation on building materials and labor, it's not uncommon when we're reviewing someone's policy to see that the building is underinsured dramatically. And so the key thing that we try to get across to veterinarians isn't just about like, oh, you need this coverage or that coverage. It's really about taking a step back and being open to and understanding what we call the intrinsic value of profit. And so for us, when we look at it, you know, every dollar of profit that a hospital loses, it takes five times that in production to offset it. So when we're talking about insurance, you may have a building have a significant problem because of a lightning strike or a fire and have a hundred thousand dollar shortfall. But in reality, it's going to cost a lot more than that to make up for it. Mm -hmm. So it's really about plugging small gaps that people may not really think about that look small on paper, but actually could then turn into something major in real life. Kind of along those lines, Rod, I mean, I guess kind of a couple follow-up questions, right? You have taken your expertise and focused very narrowly inside of the veterinary space. So I would love to understand kind of, you know, how you think about the importance of somebody who's specialized in the industry, but then also, you know, really interested in understanding, like, what makes a good insurance partner versus just a great agent who sells you a good rate? Like, what are the things that you need to be looking at and thinking about to find, uh, you know, somebody who's a good partner in that insurance game? That's such a great question. And it's probably one of the hardest things for a business owner to really focus in on. So as far as like specializing in something, that actually goes back way before Vet Insure was ever started, back to even before I was an agent when I was an underwriter. And I got into insurance underwriting middle market size business at the Hartford. And so it, it's essentially like getting a PhD in insurance because they train you on everything you can imagine. So when I had a territory in Michigan for a time, I was underwriting a lot of businesses, very diverse, but metal workers are very prolific. And I would be looking at a particular risk and not really understand the process that went on inside that metalworking shop. So I'd walk down the hall to the loss control department and ask one of those guys like, hey, here's this business and they're doing this thing. They're making this product. What are some of the things I need to think about? And I remember the first time I ever did it, I walked down and 10 minutes later, I knew how to build a hydrogen bomb just by what this guy was telling me. I still remember to this day, but we won't talk about that on this podcast. But Well, I am glad because I thought you said, you know, it didn't start with that and sure you were going to go back to like, when you were a little kid and you always dreamed about in, insuring and not losing something. So, I, I, you know, at least we didn't go back that far. No, 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 no. I want to be a professional soccer player. There was no, like, I'm going to be an insurance agent for vets in, in my mind back in grade school and stuff. <laughs> but what I learned on the underwriting desk was that I worked with agents all day long, you know, from the time I got into the office to the time I left. 
And like the typical insurance agent to your question, why this is so hard to find that partner is when someone leaves, like, you know, they get a degree in risk management or finance or some type of business degree and they go and work in insurance, they're either going to go one of two tracks. They're either going to go to a carrier, which is similar to what I did, or they're going to go work in an agency. Now, the ones that go into an agency, they're basically given a laptop, they get a license, they may have a mentor, but we all know mentorship is kind of shaky ground, regardless of the industry. And their whole goal is, is they're on a three-year draw. And at the end of three years, they hopefully have built up their book of business to an extent where they could live off of the revenue from the commission of it. And so their goal, because it's so sales driven, is to just grow, 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 grow. And it's really hard, number one, to take the time to learn about insurance, like on an expert level. And two, there's no time to be an expert of the businesses that their clients have. So they just go to chamber meetings and BNI and they may write insurance for an apartment or a restaurant, or maybe they go into their local vet clinic when their dog's sick or something. So they don't, they're not an expert of anything. They're just a generalist. And so the very first thing I would recommend for any business owner, but in this case in, in the vet world is to have someone that intimately understands the veterinary industry from an insurance and a risk perspective. That's absolutely critical. Just because your local agent is nice and brings his dog doesn't mean that he understands what can happen in your vet hospital if something's wrong with your drug book or if an animal bites a dental sensor. I mean, they just don't really understand what goes on behind the doors. So having somebody that specializes is really key. Yeah, we talk about that all the time. I mean, in really in everything that we do in this space is just like the ability to add value above and beyond the simple economics of whatever the arrangement is. I'm hearing a lot of parallels between your industry and our industry and getting that subject matter expertise as an underwriter. You really were able to learn the inner workings of these different products and different perils and different insurance policies that position you better, maybe not as a salesman, but as somebody who understands the space really, really well and can add value, which ultimately sells itself, which you know I think is the right way to go. It's the best fit for the client. You're not coming across to someone's sales. You come from it as, hey, how can I be useful in this case? And maybe that leads to us doing business. That's a win-win. So I love that you just talked about that. I mean, I'm just a huge fan of that approach. With respect to the hospital owners, I'd be just curious to hear because a lot of our clients may never have had a claim before, or they kind of look at their insurance program as just an expense and not really doing a deep dive into it. Like, What are some of the claims that you've seen that would kind of jump off the page to the average hospital owner. Like, what are some of those? Oh, wow. Kind of part and parcel of that. I've seen like really major catastrophes. I've seen buildings burn to the ground. I've seen employees get killed running errands. But then for every one of those stories, you know, I've seen situations where we'll do a review on someone's policy and they didn't have a claim, but we would catch something. Like the one that popped off the top of my head was we had a vet three, four months ago, huge $4.5 million building, and it was uninsured and had been uninsured for the last four years. And he was about 25 miles from the ocean in a hurricane coastally exposed area. Like, how does that even happen? But I guess because we've seen so much that when we're talking about policies and coverage and things, we almost talk about it in an in inevitability as opposed to it just being, you know, a risk or a possibility from happening. We had one that, that was a, a hospital that was in a leasehold space. And they'd outgrown it, which is very typical when you're, you know, you're under 2,500 square feet. I hear this all the time. And so they were coming up at the end, the last few years of their lease, and they decided to build out this beautiful six, 7,000 square foot facility. And then as they were transitioning on the very first day, the very first client that walked through the door was going into an exam room and tripped and broke both her tib and her fib. Yeah. They had to call the ambulance. It was like day one, first client. $500,000 $500,000 claim. You know, I've seen employees run an errand. I've seen hospitals that run out of a vaccine and decide, you know, hey, we need this right now. And they call up a local competitor and they buy some from them because they have a surplus and they send the, an employee down the road to get it. They've already paid for it, you know, with a credit card, cross the center line and hit somebody and get killed. So I think what happens is a lot of people pay for insurance. They think, oh, it's just this expense or it's just a thing I have to have, but not really understand that they're is the potential for major things to happen and that do happen from time to time. I mean, I guess my question on that, Rod, is is I'm guessing no business owner sets out with a goal each year to, hey, I hope I am not completely insured, right? Because, I mean, they're writing a big check for that. And I agree. I think, you know, there's certainly in some of the insurance structures, 
like the comp structure is, is maybe, you know, designed where, you know, there's revenue generated off the policy and maybe that's not, you know, like a, a whole picture focus. But so what do you recommend a business owner or a veterinary hospital owner does to protect themselves? What's the process that you have on an annual basis to ensure you're not in those positions? Because there's no way that I'm an insurance expert, and I certainly wouldn't think that a veterinarian who's seeing 25 appointments a day and running a hospital is expected to sit down and fully understand the insurance business. I think the first step, and this isn't everyone, but this is a decent percentage of the veterinary industry of hospital owners out there, is don't pay too much attention to the cost of it. Now, I know that right there, people are like, wait, what? Like, of course, I want to save money on it. But the thing is, is that with business insurance, the key thing is transferring risk. Absolutely. Like, I mean, and I'm not going to name drop anybody, but there are entities out there where, you know, known in the veterinary space, like carriers and stuff where, yeah, they're inexpensive and they don't give you any. So the, I think the number one thing is making sure that you transfer risk and having a conversation, you know, with your agent. And you don't necessarily have to do that every year. It's nice. If you want to do it, you can do it. But, you know, if you're an established, mature hospital, it's not like you've bought a ton of equipment. Nothing's really changed within the hospital. I mean, and you can do a review, but it's not as important as a hospital that's in the first five years. It's growing and adding staff and buying equipment or adding locations. Like the bigger you get and the more locations you have, the more it becomes important to not only do a review, but like when we're talking with a 20, 30, 40, 50 location corporate, I always recommend stewardship meetings, which is, you know, we can talk all year long, but I like that quarterly, let's book a time in advance and go through just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So kind of taking a pause from the practice just to review it with an insurance professional is key, but you got to invest the time to do it. How do you go about picking the right insurance professional to review it with? Good question. Thing number one is to investigate those that are specializing in your industry because you're going to eliminate a lot of agents out there that just don't know what goes on inside of a veterinary hospital. And so now when I say that, there are only a few of us that do that. You know, I mean, you have us and you have, you know, everybody knows AVMA and their program and there's maybe one or two others, but that's a really good start because at least you're talking with somebody that understands vet med. And then having a comparison, you know, there's so many hospitals that I think have a lot of confidence in where they get their insurance and they think, oh, well, I'm with this group and they represent a ton of vets, so it's got to be the best. It's like, no, first of all, talk to a group that specializes in vet med and then quote it out. Have another group that specializes in vet med look at it too. I mean, at, at that point, the likelihood that you have a coverage gap is probably pretty low. So that's probably the key starting point. Yeah, that's helpful. I love that. I mean, on the risks, so like you talked about risk transfer, which is super important, but there's also like just kind of risk management in general, like making sure things physically at the practice are a certain way. Like, are you able to advise the hospital owners on that stuff as well? Because it seems like that could also just help bring down the probability of claims and hopefully reduce their cost of insurance over a period of time. We actually do that. And we have different phases of it. So when we're first talking with a veterinary hospital owner or practice manager looking at their insurance and they have the time to consume that type of thing, we'll go over that, you know, our discussion is insurance based, but that's step four in the risk management process. You have to at least first try to identify risk that is apparent within your business and doing so with the help of someone who specializes is a really great way to really dig into it. But you have to identify potential problems first, because without doing that, it's much harder to then mitigate them later to either a, you know, avoid the risk altogether, which is really step two. Step three is of the risk that you can avoid. All right. Now, how do we lower the likelihood of these risks from happening? And then step four is transfer. So it's identify risk, avoid what you can, minimize everything else that's left, and then insurance becomes step four. Of course, step five, which we really try to caution people from going to, is assumption. You know, it's like you've done everything and you've transferred, but there's this thing over here that you just don't want to insure. Just be aware, you know, and understand why you're doing it. That's great. I love talking about the process and the specialization and just kind of the consultative approach to be in a good partner for these hospital owners. Let's dig into some of the like 
insurance details if we can. I'd love to hear more about like, is business interrupted insurance a thing that is often in these policies for hospital owners? That's actually, out of all the questions you get asked if you want to dig in, that's probably my favorite one because it's so often overlooked and it is the most important coverage that you have in a policy. So if, if you're not coastal, like you're not in Florida or in you know, the Southeast coast, like very close to the ocean, if you're in what I would call Main Street America, like you know, Atlanta, Charlotte, St. Louis, you know, Seattle, wherever, the likelihood that you have a, a fairly strong carrier like the Hartford or Travelers or Hanover is pretty high. But, you know, people have different insurers. But there's a coverage that's built into a business policy called business income and extra expense. That's the newer term for it, newer by what I mean is within the last 20 years, back in the day, they called it business interruption, which I think is a far superior term for it because it really describes what it does. But in order for business income to engage, and first of all, business income helps replace your lost income. So you have a fire and it damages significantly the inside of your hospital and you have to shut down a month or two for repairs. That's what we call the period of restoration. So you're shut down, you're restoring your business back. Simply tearing things out and putting back up drywall and fixing cabinets and all those things that happen is really academic. But then the question becomes, well, how do I pay my staff? Like, how do I pay, you know, my mortgage or the landlord or like all these typical monthly operating expenses? Like, where does the money come from that? Because we're not open. We don't have revenue coming in. So business interruption is this fantastic coverage that steps in into that place. But the key thing, or there's two key things, actually, number one, in order for it to engage, you have to, number one, have physical damage to your property from a covered cause of loss. So it has to be something covered. So for example, if a uh, lightning hits your building and there's a fire, that's covered. But if you have a flood, flood is typically excluded from a business policy. And most hospitals, if they need flood, they get it separate. So it has to be a covered cause of loss and you have to have a shutdown. But the reason why I say it's the most important policy is that, you know, you could have, you know, $1.2 million building. And while that is very important to insure, you may have 2.3 million in revenue. And what happens if that building burns to the ground? Replacing the building is, yeah, we can do that. But what's really, really important is the loss of revenue during the year that it took to rebuild your private. Is that something that's going to oftentimes be mandated from a lender if there's financing on the practice assets themselves? Depends on the lender, but for most of the time, yes, it's going to be listed in there. In fact, lenders are pretty good about hitting the high points that's necessary for collateralizing their loan. And it's very common to see business interruption. Now, when you're coastal, things change dramatically. So carriers know like, hey, you could be hit by a hurricane because your practice is in Miami or something. And so you can't get it as broadly as a hospital in Atlanta. So for example, like if there was a hospital in Norcross, Georgia, they would have 12 months of coverage. And there probably is even an extension built in automatically for an additional three months. So that hospital, if it burns to the ground, they're probably working with more than a year's worth of lost revenue coverage if they had to shut down. And so it's based on time. It's called actual loss sustain, and it's given on usually a 12 month basis. When you get coastal though, things change dramatically. So you may not be able to get a whole lot of coverage. In fact, they may cap you at only a hundred thousand. Well, if you're a 400,000 revenue hospital, that's not that big of a deal. But if you're running 2.3 million and you only have a hundred thousand of coverage, hurricane hits you, that's going to be a problem. And then even more so, a lot of the times when you're coastal, the deductibles for the hurricane are, are a percentage of your assets. So if you've got a million dollar building and your deductible is 5%, that means you've got a $50,000 deductible when the hurricane hits you. So it kind of depends on where you are, but the more of a hazardous location you're in, the more that coverage starts to weaken. In that scenario, Rod, do you just not buy in a coastal area? Is there other things you can do to mitigate that risk? How do you address that? That's funny. I had a vet once in Miami ask me, he was like, how do I save money on insurance? And my flat answer was move out of Miami. In all seriousness, no, I mean, build your hospital wherever you want to. Uh, there's so much demand in places like Florida but there's just certain realities that come with it. So if you're going to have it in a coastally exposed area, just understand that, you know, when you're looking at the expenses of your hospital, you're going to pay more for certain items because of your location. But, but I, I wouldn't tell anybody don't do you it. You can get insurance to protect yourself in there. Um, not that it's not available. It is available. Well, actually, over the last year, insurance in Florida has been 
way harder to obtain compared to years past. Not to get all political, but DeSantis did try to change some of the law so that it was easier for homeowners to get coverage. It'd be easier for businesses to get coverage because attorneys have literally lit that state on fire. And the night before the law went into place, very big national law firm that filed something like 25,000 lawsuits on the last day. So there's just a lot of legal challenges in Florida that make insurance a little bit more difficult to get a hold of. I mean, we've seen, I think, two or three insurance carriers go insolvent in Florida in the last couple of years. So as that happens and the market hardens, the cost goes up dramatically and the amount of carriers that want to offer coverage go down dramatically. And then the other challenge in Florida, besides the fact that it's so coastally exposed, is that a lot of the buildings that veterinary hospitals are in or choose to remodel are old. So yeah. if the building's over 25 years, there might have been four carriers wanting to quote you, and now you have one. So it just kind of depends. I would never tell somebody, don't build a hospital here or there. Just know that if you're in an area that has major exposure to things like that, like hurricanes, that insurance will definitely be harder to obtain in a competitive way, and you're going to pay more for it. Well, I was just going to kind of pivot off of something that's maybe regionally impacted and and try to, you know, I know, Rod, you and I have had a lot of discussions on some of the cybersecurity and cyber insurance, and how are you directing veterinary hospitals in kind of this new world as it relates to cyber insurance, and how do you protect yourself now that you've got credit card numbers and personal data. And I know we're not dealing with HIPAA issues, but you got a lot of people's personal information inside your practice management system. I feel like I've been talking about cyber insurance as one of like my top three or four coverages for years and years back before I think cyber insurance was really something that was on people's minds. And I always looked at it as two part. Like if you were to Google it, you're going to find a lot of insurance websites talking about it. And the way that it reads it, I think they make it sound like it's all one thing, meaning like data breach and cyber liability. They're all the same thing, but the truth is they're not at all. So when you look at an intrusion, there's two different sides of it. You've got the first party side of it, which is this ransom, this problem, you know, where you get hacked and you're shut down. Now you're losing revenue. So if you're shut down for even five days, how does that impact your business? And so having a really strong data breach policy can help you recover the lost revenue from that intrusion if the intrusion shut down your hospital. Then there's the flip side of it, not so much the first party. First party, again, is lost revenue. It's stealing your information, your employees' information, and things like that. The cyber liability side of it is when you, you know, they hack your system and then ransom your client information, or worse, if they're able to penetrate the point of sale system. And that's the one thing I think veterinarians don't realize is an exposure because they think, oh, well, it's encrypted. My credit card machine should be safe. And I've had a few vets tell me that. And I always redirect them and say, look at Target, look at Home Depot. Like Target, for example, what's crazy about their story is, you know, if you walk into a Target store today and they have, it's not just like what I would call the old Kmart, they have the grocery side of it too. And they started going into this model where in the grocery section, the LEDs were motion sensor. And so they would go off to save energy. But then when somebody walked down the aisle, they would come back on. And there was a contractor that was in a Target store that was installing these motion sensor LEDs. And he was updating what he was doing at that store from his laptop, which was a company issued laptop. And he was logging in through the open Wi-Fi inside the Target, but there was a virus on his laptop no one knew about. And that thing was so powerful that it was able to access Target's main system in that store from the open Wi-Fi, infiltrate the point of sale machines in the store, and then work its way into corporate and rain down on other stores. Now, something like Target probably has a $50 million, $100 million a year budget on this kind of stuff to prevent yeah. it. What I always say to vet hospital is if Target has a 40 or $50 million budget and they got hit off of something like that, the typical vet hospital is low-hanging fruit, absolutely low-hanging fruit. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable when you talk about hard markets, and I feel like that part of it is just going to get more and more complicated as the bad guys continue to evolve and figure out ways to utilize the PII and the other information they're able to extract to their benefit. So uh, that kind of ties in nicely. I mean, we want to talk a little bit about any emerging trends. The cyber thing sounds like you've been tracking it closely for some time. I'm sure that it's become at least conversational as a topic to all the hospital owners you work with. And I'm sure that they're probably discussing that with their point of sale providers as well. But 
what are the other emerging trends? Like what are some of the other things you're seeing that is on the forefront, you know, that cyber would have been probably 10 years ago? Like what's the next thing? Is there anything out there that you want to be getting ahead of and talking to the veterinary community about that maybe they haven't seen yet? Cyber is probably the answer I would give to that question, just because the way with the emergence of AI, my attitude is that AI is growing so rapidly that a lot of the virus, malware, intrusion protection products, I don't think will be able to evolve as quickly. And I think will become obsolete in a lot of ways, because you can go on a lot of these AI programs and you can type in, you know, create a program to do this or do that. And I just think it's going to become way too easy. But one of the other areas that I don't know if I'd call it emerging as much because I think it's been relevant for a while is the employment practices side. I think it's probably one of the main areas that we like to really hone in on. But what makes it even more relevant today than years past is just the increase in the speed of entitlement of employees and staff. And so when I talk to a veterinarian, one of the things when I teach CE, I always ask, all right, you're a vet, you have veterinary malpractice. Raise your hand if you agree that a pet owner could sue you even though you did nothing wrong with their animal. And every time I ask that, everybody raises their hand. So I say, okay, so fine. So we'll all agree that being a veterinarian or providing a professional service, like I'm an insurance agent, you know, you're a financial advisor, we don't make something tangible, we provide the service. So we'll all agree that when you provide a professional service, there's a certain level of volatility out there that we could be sued, even though we did not err, we did not make a mistake, and we did nothing wrong. Owning a business is very similar when it comes to employees. Because biz, I see this all the time. Business owners can get sued by current or ex-employees alleging things like wrongful termination, harassment, discrimination, retaliation, which is the biggest, infliction of emotional distress, failure to promote, failure to pay overtime, the list goes on. The key component of that, though, is that 67% of those lawsuits are meritless. So we have an angry, upset ex-employee mad at this business owner and two thirds of them, the business owner didn't do anything wrong. So the question is not only like, are you protecting yourself, but it's also understanding that the average defense cost of one of those across all industries, this isn't a veterinary specific statistic, but those cases can cost as much as $150,000. And then if you have over 15 employees, they can go to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. And if the EEOC sees merit in the claim, it's like having the government come after you. And so when we look at veterinary hospitals, like, you know, one, two, three doctor practice, having a strong employment practices liability limit is one of the easiest coverage gaps for us to find. We find it over half the time. They may only have like five or 10 grand. Maybe the agent did an okay job and gave them 50, but we're still telling them, okay, that's too low. We need to bump that up. So I wouldn't necessarily say that's emerging as much because I think it's been relative for a while, but I feel like my team here has that conversation about eight to nine times a day, each person with a vet hospital. It's a lot. That's pretty unbelievable, man. I like the way that you framed that and the way that you kind of led them through that conversation to just help some of the like mental gaps we all have when we think about, you know, our own businesses and the people we work with and all that fun stuff. Before we go back to Travis to hit us with this last, our final question we always do which I know you're a listener of the show, so you probably already know it's coming. But let's talk about the claims process a little bit. So how are you guys involved in the event that there is a claim? And just to give you some background, like our firm does some property casualty stuff for some of our clients. And we always want to be involved before they make a claim just so that we can understand, is it worth doing? Or is there even merit to it? Is it worth doing? Or is it just going to result in overall higher premium down the road? How involved are you in the claim process? We're involved as much as the clients want us to be. I mean, we want to make sure on one end that they have, you know, 24-7, 365 access right now at any time to talk to a human about a potential claim just for the sake that we want the process to be as quick as as possible. But, you know, if we get past all the basic things like the client that mixes up reverse and drive and ends up driving their car through the front door, which we take that at least once a month somewhere. When you get past those things that are pretty academic and just need to get filed and you're talking about liability or even minor things like, do I need to file this? We always recommend to call us and we can walk through that process. Because like with liability, especially like when we have clients and they have a vet professional issue, it's really important to call and talk to your agent because with vet professional, for example, it doesn't necessarily mean that the problem actually is going to become a claim. For example, you could have a client mad at you and file a complaint with the licensing department. And the first you know about it is you're getting a letter 
from the state licensing department and we'll get calls like, oh, Rod, oh my God, what do I do? Do I need to hire an attorney? It's like, hold on, no, let's just talk about it. What does it say? And they'll be like, well, it's this particular client and they just want a copy of the file. I'm like, okay, just give the state the copy of the file. It's going to be okay. It's not necessarily a claim yet. So we, we definitely want to try to walk people back from the cliff a little bit because not all the time, but there are a lot of cases where a situation really isn't as bad as they would seem or they would think that it is. And they just need someone to kind of help them walk through it mentally. After that, though, after the, you know, a claim is filed, then we monitor it pretty closely. So we just want to make sure that everyone's communicating, that, you know, the carrier is getting what they need, that our clients are getting what they need to make sure that the claim process moves slowly. But inevitably, not all claims are going to go the same. You know, we're talking property things. It's relatively academic. A liability, there's no pun intended, and this is not a veterinary thing, it's an insurance thing, but liability has a long tail. Things can draw out, like car accidents and things like that. So we just want to make sure that we're a part of the process, that we're having a conversation with the carrier so that nobody slips through the cracks, so there's no time that's being lost. Travis, I don't know if you're ready to go to the final question. I actually had one more thing for Rod that he just reminded me with his not unintentional pun, although it made me laugh a little bit. Uh, <laughs> But we we talked about tailor risk with clients before. I mean, you know, this wasn't something we had planned to discuss, but like the amount of consolidation over the last few years, it's no surprise to anybody. No big reveals on that. But with that, a lot of our clients have sold their practices and fear they may still have some exposure in the event some sort of claim comes forward two, three years down the road. Because it was an asset sale, there's still uh, exposure there. So do you talk to folks like that about the tail risk and tail insurance on something like that? Or is that once the business is sold, you're kind of out? Like, what are your initial thoughts? That's a fantastic question. And that's a wonderful, like one of the last questions we could talk about. That's probably going to end up being my favorite because what ends up happening, a lot of business owners have already sold the practice. Like we get calls all the time from vets that, oh, hey, I sold it last month. If you have a practice and you're looking at, we call it initial descent. And so when you're into that initial descent phase and you're going to sell your practice, Definitely recommend having a conversation, not just with your insurance agent, but with your financial advisor, with your veterinary consultant, if you have one, just because there's certain aspects that you need to be aware of. So to your point, tail coverage, like, again, that's not a veterinary on at all. That's just an insurance term. But so tail coverage is relative when a particular type of liability you have is claims made. So for me to describe claims made, I actually have to describe the opposite of it. So for example, let's say the three of us. We get together. What was the name of that really cool sushi place we went to that one time? Fudo. Fudo? Okay. All right. So let's say that the three of us walk into Fudo and we're eating and we notice that someone walks in and slips and falls right there in the doorway. And they're embarrassed more than anything. They don't really think that they're hurt. And you know, maybe they stay a little bit. Maybe they don't. Maybe they leave. And let's say, for example, that Fudo closed their doors the very next day. But then two months later, the owners of Fudo got sued by that person who fell stating, well, you know, the floor was slippery. And of course you can take the same example in a vet hospital too. Somebody's slipping in the waiting area. So what would happen is the general liability, general liability is a coverage built into the business policy that covers third party injury. So even though Fudo was closed, their business policy, the liability was based on occurrence, which means all that has to have happened for that policy to trigger is that that person falling occurred when they had active coverage. doesn't make a difference that they closed the doors or sold to a big corporate restaurant group or whatever. That's all that matters. So general liability, you don't need tail on. However, when you have executive risk insurances, such like employment practices, which we've talked about, cyber, which we've talked about, if you're a big group and you have directors and officers, some vet professional out there is claims made. Claims made, what that says is in order for the coverage to trigger both the event itself has to have occurred when you had active coverage and you have to have an active form of coverage when the claim is made. So to your point, it's like, okay, you got this vet hospital, they took Rod's advice, they had this wonderful employment practices and cyber policy, but then they sold to this big corporate. What I would tell that vet hospital is, okay, we can cancel the policy, but it's not really a, a hard cancel. What we're going to do is we're going to put your policy right now into runoff. So it's essentially going to run off until either the sale or the end of the current policy term. And then we're going to recommend you buy something called extended reporting period or the acronym is just ERP. That's what tail coverage is. And so tail coverage buys time in the future where if someone were to come back and try to sue you, 
So in the case of employment practices, you've got an employee who got really mad at you for selling and got angry and was upset about something they say that you did when you owned it, but then they sue you a year later after you sold it. If you bought extended reporting period or tail coverage, that policy will still trigger. If you do not buy that coverage and you just cancel a claims made policy flat and someone sues you after you canceled it, it's as if you never had it. So the key thing with tail is the event itself has to have occurred when you had coverage and then you have to have some form of active coverage when a claim is actually made or presented. You and I have talked about that on multiple occasions. Yes, we have. Where there's people that are selling, they're fixated on a dollar fixated on like the broker just getting the maximum dollar. And once that transaction closes, they put the money under their mattress and they run and hide. Uh, Yes, they do. And that is really like, again, the two businesses that you guys are in help protect people from doing that. Yeah. I love that, Travis. I love the way that you said that. I mean, it makes total sense. And, you know, it's awesome to hear some of the consistencies with the way Rod and his team approach things and the way that we approach things at the Signature FD side. So, I mean, was awesome having you on, Rod. Travis, you want to go to our uh, final question for him? Absolutely. I always love wrapping it up with this, Rod. So I'm pretty sure you've listened to our show enough to know that there's a a pending question that, you know, it says everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change the uh, toilet paper rule. So, you know, we always like to ask our guests, if you've ever been caught kind of sneaking out of the bathroom without changing that toilet paper rule? I like Jeff Sanford's answer. He just said, yeah. <laughs> he's a student of the pod, man. He, he knows all the, he's already got all the episodes. He's got all the, geez, that was amazing. That's the best response we've had yet by far. <laughs> I mean, and it was just dead can. Well, I mean, it, and then we always conclude with, so you don't always change the toilet paper, but I'm guessing you are trying to change the world, Rod. So what's the advice you have for our listeners that want to change the world? You call us. Vetinsure.com. Just go to Vetinsure.com or you can just email me direct at, at Rod at Vetinsure.com. Or my Calendly, which is Calendly.com forward slash Rod Finnegan. Just call Venture. We'll help you do it. (laughs) Shameless plug. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for coming on and being a part of the show, Rod. Thanks for coming on, man. Huge fan of what you guys do. Great to have seen you down at VMX. Excited to partner with you guys on anything we can going forward. And uh, hopefully this is a great episode for our listeners. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks again for tuning in to the Vet Worthwhile podcast. You can find us online at signaturefd.com slash signature veterinary. And then our ask would be, if you found this episode valuable, just think of one friend or colleague that you think would enjoy the content and just, just please share. So thanks again. We'll see you next time. Travis York is the owner of 3-in-1 Vet Advisors and a partner of Signature FD. 3-in-1 Vet Advisors is a veterinary consulting and strategic planning firm of which Signature FD has no involvement or ownership. James Yost is a partner and wealth advisor at Signature FD. Signature FD is an investment advisor registered with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. 3-in-1 Vet Advisors and Signature FD are not affiliated. Mr. York provides all non-investment advisory services through 3-in-1 Vet Advisors. The opinions of the guests and the contents of this podcast are intended to be educational only and should not be relied upon as investment, tax, business, or planning advice. You should consult with a professional advisor prior to taking any course of action that may impact you or your business.